Hi, good evening, or welcome. My name is Richard Segan, and I'm the, fr I'm the president of the Friends of Brookline Public Health, and very pleased to welcome you and have you join us on our first program of 2022. Uh, we have a great group of panelists, and I just want to say a few words before turning it over to Chris Chandler Sukut, who will be moderating our program today. The Friends of Brookline Public Health was established in uh, 1996, I believe, to, to promote local support for public health at the community level. And I don't think anyone could have imagined 26 years ago when the Friends was started that public health would be in the forefront of the news for two years. In my 30 plus years in the public health field, there's obviously been nothing like this period. And I think it's ironic, isn't it ironic, that on this day when we are celebrating the beginning of National Public Health Week, tomorrow the federal government is going to be discontinuing financial support for COVID vaccinations uh, for the uninsured after already ending uh, financial support for testing and treatment because of a deadlock Congress and, and a lack of bipartisan vision about the importance of public health and public health infrastructure and funding. The, the Friends was started in part to address inequities in health and social services. And the pandemic has highlighted these inequities, but also led to a polarization and an antagonism to an attacks on public health officials that few of us would have foreseen prior to the pandemic. It now seems more important than ever, in my opinion, for us to be standing with our public health colleagues and officials advancing on equity and assuring that we in Brookline lead in public health as we do in other public areas. Uh, the Friends has sponsored a mini grants program for numbers of years to help and allow community members to advance public health initiative. We've also sponsored educational programs on timely topics in public health. And please expect information about future plans to be in the mail soon. And we hope that you'll renew and join with other members of our community that have supported the Friends. So now before we introducing our moderator, I just want to publicly recognize four people that have worked tirelessly on public health issues in Brookline and they've helped in so many ways with the Brookline Friends of Public Health and worked on this program. So special thanks to Jarlene Johnson, Amanda Hopper, Lynn Carlston, and Pat Mayer. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Daniel Sukit. Uh, locally, Chris is a town meeting member. Chris, you can correct me if I get any of these things wrong, but you're a town meeting member. I believe you're an elected trustee of the Public Libraries of Brookline a Brookline Community Foundation board member and a member of the town's Medical Reserve Corps and Community Emergency Response Team. Chris was Assistant Director of Diversity at Brookline's Office of D Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. She has taught graduate courses at, this, at Simmons in the Department of Public Health and now serves as an adjunct faculty member at Temple University, teaching public health advocacy in their College of Public Health. Chris served as a gubernatorial appointee to the Massachusetts Association, Massachusetts Asian American Commission, and the Commission on the Status of Women. She served in the Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts Advocacy Board of Directors, and currently serves in the Board of Directors for Planned Parenthood Medical Center. And Chris, we should all be very proud in Brookline that Chris is the future, is the president-elect of the 25,000 member strong American Public Health Association. Congratulations, Trick, Chris, on that. Chris earned her bachelor's degree from Boston University, an MPH from the BU School of Public Health, and a PhD from Northeastern University. I've also had the good fortune to have worked with Chris on several projects, and I can honestly say, honestly say that there's nothing quite as reassuring as to have Chris step forward and take on a project with you. We're incredibly fortunate to have Chris as a neighbor and colleague in Brookline. So Chris, welcome, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here, especially because I love Brookline um, through and through. Um, and then also a special shout out to Richard Segan, who does so much for Brookline Sister City Program, Kezawake, um, in Nicaragua as well. So. Um, 
he's here, there, and everywhere as well as Nicaragua too. So welcome everyone. I am so excited. First, I want to get some logistical things done just so that, you know, we're all on the same page. What we're going to do is we'll have a little bit of a chat here, um, but we're going to start off. I'll welcome, I'll introduce you to each of the panelists. Each panelist will speak. And then at the end of that, we'll have a Q&A. So attendees, you're going to be so so welcomed to join in that conversation. And you can do so by submitting a question to the panelists. You just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and your question will be forwarded to us as panelists. Or if you wanna make a comment and speak, you can use the raise hand icon. The technical staff is actually then gonna forward those questions on to me. So hopefully you'll, you'll join in. We want this to be a robust discussion. Now, um, I am so excited and honored because this is the first full week of April and for over the past 25 years, the American Public Health Association brings together communities all across the United States to observe National Public Health Week as a time to recognize the contributions of public health and highlight important issues that are important to improving our nation's health. And as we sit here in this pandemic, we know public health is important. So on behalf of the American Public Health Association, I'm thankful that you're taking the time out of your incredibly busy and full schedules to join us in observing National Public Health Week 2022 together in Brookline here. But most of all, that you're a part, an important part of our growing movement to create the healthiest nation in one generation. Now you might not know it, but each day of National Public Health Week, we have a daily theme. And Today's is racism is a public health crisis. Long-standing inequities in healthcare, income, housing, education, and so many more factors that influence health and well-being have widened during this COVID-19 pandemic. So in looking at racism as a public health crisis and how the inequities widened, it seems most fitting to have Dr. Sandro Galea, the Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health, here and to start us off. So to tell you about this incredible, amazing public health leader, um, he is a physician, an epidemiologist, an author. He is the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean at BU School of Public Health, former chair of epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He is also one of the most widely cited scholars in the social sciences. Dean Galea has published extensively in peer-reviewed literature about the social causes of health, of mental health, and trauma. He was born in Malta, immigrated to Canada with his family at the age of 14. After he received his medical degree from the University of Toronto, he worked in Somalia with Doctors Without Borders before attending graduate school at Harvard and Columbia University. I feel like there is a movie in the making on your bio, and we should think Will you play it or who will play you? Um, but <laughs> sorry, I just, as I read your bio, I'm like, wow. Um, he is an author of many, many things, of course. First, to start out with well, I don't know if you can see it too well, get it well. Um, and, but now today we're gonna look at his book, The Contagion Next Time, his most recent book, which one reviewer noted, challenges all of us to tackle the deep rooted obstacles preventing us from becoming a truly vibrant and equitable nation. So let's look together now, we're gonna to turn to you, Dean Sandro Galea, and what are your thoughts on how we can tackle racism, socioeconomic inequality head on and, and tell us, how did you write this? How, I mean, we're in a pandemic. I'm amazed if I'm not wearing sweatpants, but you wrote a book. So how did you do all this? And tell us what can we do better in Brookline as we're emerging from this pandemic, hopefully, and for the contagion next time. So I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Cheney Selkut. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, we are really honored that Dr. Cheney Selkut is one of our distinguished alumni. And uh, that was a, a, a really uh, overly generous introduction. Thank you. Um, I, as a resident of Brookline, I'm always delighted to be part of these events. I, and I always feel like... Um, I am uh, I and my children are being well looked after in public health in Brookline. So thank you to everybody who makes it so. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just talk about the book for a couple of minutes, really, because then we want to have conversation. The uh, the book is called The Contagion Next Time, which many of you will will know is an homage to James Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time, which is in and of itself um, a reference to a line in an African American spiritual, 
And the book of the fire next time is a it's pretty searing indictment of race in America and racism in America. Now, the book Condition Next Time is not only about race, it's about a whole host of factors. But what the book tries to do is it asks the question, what is the dominant story of the pandemic? What story should we take from the pandemic? And I wrote the book in the fall of 2020, pretty early in the pandemic, because I knew it was going to come out. And when you write a book, it takes a year then for it to come out. So it's going to come out in the fall, in November of 2021. And I thought that at that time, there are going to be many books emerging about vaccines and about treatments and about sentinel surveillance systems and about stockpiling. And these things are all important, right? They're all foundational to public health. But my argument in the book is that that's not the dominant story of the pandemic. The dominant story of the pandemic is why is it that we as a country did so poorly? Now, we're about to get to about 1 million deaths in the country, which is a tragedy, truly a tragedy. And per population, we've done worse than any other comparable country anywhere in the world. And the book says, why is that? And it's not because we did not get the vaccines quickly. We got the vaccines quite quickly. It's not because we didn't distribute vaccines effectively. We sort of fumbled along with vaccines. Our vaccine distribution, as everybody knows, has been meh, so-so. It's not because our hospitals did not do well. Our hospitals actually did quite well in the, in the pandemic once people got in the hospital. No. We did poorly in the pandemic because for two reasons. Number one is our underlying under investment in the conditions that make people healthy. The pandemic found us, as I say in the introduction to the book, as sitting ducks. We as a country were much less healthy than we should have been. We were living sicker, shorter lives before the pandemic. Americans were dying five years sooner than other comparable high-income countries. And that's despite the fact that we as a country invest much more in healthcare than any other country. But the, the investment in healthcare is all investment in hospitals and clinics. In fact, our investment in public health has been going down for decades. As a result, we as a country have had unnecessary disproportionate prevalence of non-communicable diseases, things like diabetes, things like heart disease, all of which predisposed us to ill health in the time of the pandemic. So we were a sicker country to begin with, that illness was maldistributed with inequities in that illness, with groups particularly who are marginalized much more vulnerable than other groups. And by groups that are marginalized, I talk in the book about race, I talk about black Americans, I talk about immigrants, I talk about people who make less income. All of these groups who are marginalized in this country historically carry a burden of poor health that we have been willing to tolerate as a country for a long time, which we should not have been willing to tolerate because really it is on us to, to ask what is it that makes health so inequitable? So what can we do about it? And that all, you know, I could have been talking about this in 2019, in fact, the last time I spoke at Brookline Public Health was before the pandemic, and it was about these topics. And um, so these conditions resulted when the pandemic hit with a virus that made people who are already vulnerable, much more sick, made them much, much more likely to die. We as a country were sitting ducks for that. That's number one. That's reason A. Reason B is because we had underinvested in the systems that could protect us if a pandemic hit. And those are largely public health systems. Those are systems to make sure that people have an opportunity to work from home to protect themselves from a new virus. Those are systems to make sure that we can actually test and trace people so we can actually have a way of containing a new outbreak so it doesn't become a pandemic. We have had a decline, year on year decline in public health spending for the past 15 years. We about only about 25% of health departments across the country have an epidemiologist on staff. Most it's the, uh, they spend about 2.7 to 3% of their state budget on public health. So we have underinvested in the forces that could keep us healthy if a pandemic hits. So you put the two together and you have a perfect storm. You put the two together and you have a perfect storm. You have a le less healthy population than it needs to be. And you have an infrastructure that is not well invested in to keep us healthy. I'll conclude with a metaphor that I use in the book. I use the metaphor of a ship going through a storm in the book. And the ship going through the storm there are three components to keep the ship from sinking. There's the captain, there are the, the crew, and there's the ship itself, right? The captain is political leadership, and we can talk more about political leadership. The crew is the people, it's us, the people, it's our health as a population. And the ship is our infrastructure to keep us healthy. Well, I think we can all envision, right, that if you have a so-so crew and a so-so ship, but the captain's great, you might make it through the storm. Or if the captain's not so good, but the crew is great and the ship is seaworthy, you might make it through the storm. But if all three are failing, the ship is not going to make it through the storm. And that's what happened to us as a country. We, the people, the crew, 
we were sicker than we needed to be. As a result, we were quite vulnerable to the virus. The ship, which is our infrastructure that can keep us healthy, had holes all over it. Political leadership stumbled on any number of dimensions, which we can also talk about. And that is what resulted in our ship metaphorically sinking during the pandemic. So the reason I wrote this book is because I wanted a book out there that says this at a time when we are going to start thinking about what did we learn from the pandemic? Because my worry is this. My worry is our ship limps along and then the storm stops and it's calm water and a gentle breeze and a sun. And you know, we say, ah, we almost drowned, but you know what? We're okay now. It doesn't matter that captain doesn't know what they're doing. It doesn't matter that the crew is not very healthy. It doesn't matter that there's a hole in the hull because now we're okay and we can just bob along. And we forget that the next pandemic will come and we will then sink. So really what I try to do with this book is try to surface these points that the fundamental challenge for us in the pandemic was a population that was sicker than it needed to be because we underinvest in what makes people healthy in stable housing, in livable wages, in gender equity, in making sure we don't have community violence. All of those forces we underinvest in making us much less healthy than we have to be and has been so for decades and centuries. A, and B, because we've underinvested in public health infrastructure that could protect us. And really, the book is a call for us to remember that, to make sure that we think about health the right way, invest in these forces to prevent the contagion next time, but also, of course, to make us healthier between now and then. And I will stop there. It's a privilege to be here with you. Incredible. So even though that was a five-minute summary of this book, I still think everyone should read it. Um, because if you're like me, you'll read it and you'll be shouting out yes and, you know, raising your hand or, or because I'm sometimes listening it to on Audible, I'm just like talking to my dog about just how amazing his examples are and his storytelling. And he uses lots of other things like soccer and everything else. So, so um, please pick that up. But now that you laid this foundation for us, I want to turn to Giselle Farrow Pico. Um, of the executive director of our Brookline Community Foundation. She has more than 15 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. She's a longstanding commitment to equity and social justice. And during her tenure here, we are so lucky at the Brookline Community Foundation, she's led the development of our foundation's new strategic plan called uh, Forward Together which prioritizes community-centered and collaborative approaches to advancing opportunity and equity-focused initiatives around racial and economic justice in Brookline. Giselle is a native Spanish speaker, the daughter of immigrants from Colombia, and a proud first-generation college graduate, yay, me too, um, with a BS from Georgetown University and a JD from the University of Miami School of Law. So Dr. Galea, said so eloquently, you know, he, he wanted to write this so that we don't forget, right? So we don't, um, so we, we learn from this. Um, and I get, and just help, please tell us about what the Brookline Community Foundation has done and that you've led through this community engagement listening sessions from the people, from the crew on the boat, so to speak. And what do we need to do so that the contagion next time we're all rowing forward together through any storm? Um, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And I'll start with um, just noting that I hope my Wi-Fi doesn't drop, but if it does, keep going. Um, uh, and I wanted to first say, um, for those who are sort of curious um, uh, around community foundations and what they do, uh, at the Brookline Community Foundation is one of, I believe, a little over 14 community foundations in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, our community foundation, as with many others, as many others, uh, we marshal resources and we mobilize philanthropy. So private capital philanthropy uh, for the public good to address persistent challenges in the community. And so it is incredibly important for uh, our community foundation to understand and deeply understand what are those persistent challenges so that we can then invest in addressing um, both individual needs, but also root causes of those inequities. So uh, systemic, um, systemic inequities upstream. Um, we were very, very lucky to have partnered with the town of Brookline to undergo 
um, what uh, we thought was maybe a six week, six week community engagement process. And it ended up being about six months, um, which makes a lot of sense because um, I think locally, um, and this happens in every community, you want to really uh, deeply understand what community members are going through and get really just diverse perspectives. Um, and more importantly, perspectives from those who are um, uh, sort of experiencing deeper inequ inequities um, and the, where the challenges, um, they're experiencing the challenges uh, a lot more and a lot more acutely, I would say. Um, so in our community engagement process, we, I'll just say that we, uh, we did about, I would say a, a little over 20 community engagement events um, and had uh, over 700 uh, sort of instances of participation through an online survey, focus groups, as well as listening sessions. And um, not surprisingly, a lot of what um, a lot of what Dr. Galea shared in terms of key impacted groups and marginalized groups, and a lot of those social determinants of health, those are the things that rose to the top as um, the needs of community members and who was most impacted. So I'll I'll just share a couple of things um, in a couple of categories. So one of the things that we learned, um, and again, this is all coming from community members, not the foundation, community members elevated that those who were most impacted uh, during the pandemic or throughout the pandemic um, were, uh, and I should say, we are hard pressed to find anyone who was not impacted, but these were the groups that um, were impacted the most per our respondents, uh, children and youth, um, who experienced isolation, decreased interaction with peers, challenges with remote learning. Um, uh, uh, they also elevated individuals and families living on low or limited income. Um, and so you've got sort of also groups where there are um, uh, sort of the intersectionality of what they represent. So it could be BIPOC individuals who are also living on lower limited income who might also be living either in public housing or in group homes. And so when you see groups and people that sort of cross a lot of those different categories, then they sort of um, are, are, are experiencing those challenges compounded. Um, another group, of course, were older adults impacted physically, mentally, socially, um, higher risks of severe illness, but also with the inability to go outside, lack of available accessible transportation. Um, and, you know, we relied so much on technology. This is a particular group that had sometimes um, decreased access to technology or, and or familiarity with technology. Um, uh, and then two more groups, people living in public health housing and or group settings, um, having been among, among the most impacted with many, again, you're sort of hearing the same themes, experiencing isolation, low or little ability to work remotely, unreliable access to Wi-Fi, et cetera. Um, and I think in terms of institutions of who was impacted, um, according to our community members, uh, two groups uh, sort of rose to the top there, nonprofit organizations that are really sort of on the front lines of supporting community members in terms of a lot of the social services um, and food, you know, social services, food access, et cetera. And the other group, which I find interesting is the town of Brookline departments. Um, we're, de we're identified as generally being understaffed, underfunded, and in particular, um, the town of Brookline uh, Public Health Department as severely underfunded and severely understaffed with many positions unfilled. Um, so I'll move on with, um, I think, was something that really resonated um, from the previous speaker um, around um, what, I'll share what, what investments the community members um, recommended that the town of Brookline make, and then my own fears around what's not going to be invested in. Um, so community members felt uh, investment should go towards direct cash assistance, education, essential needs. So essentially social determinants of health, um, housing, mental health programs and services, all the things really that make you healthy that are not medical care. Um, and uh, 
and the top two areas of investments um, that our community members identified were investing in our public health infrastructure, our public health response, and the public health department or through the public health department. And the second investment area um, was crisis intervention services to support those key impacted groups. So youth, older adults, people from low income households and um, BIPOC populations. So that means black indigenous and other people of color. And I think the thing that really stands out to me is sort of I was sharing these recommendations with um, town leadership is this idea that, well, we're okay, we're emerging from this and let's invest the approximately $43 million of ARPA funding. You know, here's what we're thinking in a variety of ways. But I, I heard when I kept on mentioning top response is public health infrastructure, public health response, public health department. Um, I was sort of hearing this, um, the sort of um, uh, that metaphor around, well, we're in the safe harbor now, everything's going better. Why would we invest significant resources when we're coming out of the pandemic? And I think my sort of my response to that is, um, this is exactly when we should invest those resources to ensure that when this happens again, not if, our, our local community really has the public health infrastructure um, to, 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 support, to support our community. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful that, that our town does make those uh, infrastructure investments in public health. Thank you so much, Giselle, and thank you for not just the six months, but all you're doing since you joined the Brookline Community Foundation. More information at brooklinecommunity.org. Um, also, um, I want to turn it now to Kimberly Richardson. So we're honored to have her here. She is um, not only an activist and a social worker, but Kimberly was recently um, honored as a 2022 Brookline Woman of the Year by the Brookline Commission for Women. Um, so I just want to put that shout out out there because um, a lot of times people don't, um, don't recognize all the work that's done behind the scenes. So Kimberly is here to share her voice, to push for fundamental changes in Brookline and to support also the most marginalized residents. She moved to Brookline in 2012 and resides in BHA public housing. Her children have attended the public school here. She's also a town meeting member in precinct two, and she sits on the task force to reimagine public safety in Brookline. She also serves on the police commissioner's advisory committee. The Brookline Housing Authority Working Group and is part of the leadership of the Brookline for Racial Justice Bridge. She is part of the redistricting committee that created two majority minority precincts in order for BIPOC folks to have an opportunity to share their voices. So I don't know how you found time to join us here tonight, but I am so thankful for it. So please, you know, Kimberly, now we, we laid the groundwork. Dean Galea told us what you know, in his academic research and his warning, Giselle said, this is what Brookline said, but you're a Brookline resident and also an activist and a leader and working in our town. What should we do with this 43 million in ARPA funding? What, what can we do? Um, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm gonna buy both of those books because they sound amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna share like what started for me in the pandemic and then what I think I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, that's kind of little things out. I was gonna try to add, look, I can't do that. Um, so when the pandemic began, I remember having um, a lot of fear and, and, and anxiety as I can only imagine everyone in the world was experiencing, right? We were experiencing the same feeling. Um, I had no real information about COVID and received all of my information from social media, including this myth, right? That black people couldn't get COVID. Um, when in reality, we later found out that COVID was affecting BIPOC at an alarming rate um, in comparison to white people. Um, I felt like we, the government had failed us. They did, they failed us. Um, they did not, we were not prepared for this pandemic. Um, but some things could have been done differently. And I think one of the key things that could have been done differently in Brookline was information. Um, there was not a lot of information provided to BHA residents. I, I, and I understand we were all dealing with, with like the lack of information. Uh, like it was, we didn't know. So, but 
I remember um, receiving some blue mask on my doorknob that said something like Brookline strong. You know, I didn't feel strong and I, I just felt lost. Um, I had a few friends in VHA, so we shared different resources um, that was helpful to each other, including like how to prevent food insecurities, right? Um, this was information that should have been um, spread widely in uh, underpaid communities. Residents who live in VHA who have large families social distancing. I know I couldn't. I, I remember living in my bedroom for months trying to stay away from my children who worked in the food service industry. Um, I also understand that VHA couldn't really do anything about cramped living environments, but this is it, it didn't help the spread of COVID, especially for those family members who still had to go out, who were essential workers. And when I say essential, I mean people working in grocery stores and restaurants, right? They were at risk through the entire pandemic. Um, the government provided pandemic related pay for those, you know, who so they, they provided this pay, but they shouldn't have been penalized for like receiving those funds, like the um, pandemic unemployment, stimulus check, things like that. So why were they penalized? Like, for example, I received information that residents' rents were increased because of this pandemic unemployment that they but they will never see again, right? So that shouldn't have been happening. Um, some communities throughout Massachusetts started a pilot program called Guaranteed Income, right? In order to help uplift underpaid people out of poverty. So a group of Brookline activists, activists and myself, we recently met with a Cambridge mayor to discuss the benefits of this program and if it was serve its purpose in Brookline. Um, if a Guaranteed Income program was started in Brookline, this money should not be accounted toward, should not be count it toward income, right? Because if it does, it will affect rents, right? Rent will go up, EBT benefits could be decreased and therefore it would no longer serve its purpose to lift underpaid people out of poverty. The same way the pandemic un unemployment didn't serve the purpose, right? Of trying to help people pandemic in an economic way. Um, Why, well, I, I know this sounds, doesn't sound like, what does that, what, what does this have to do with anything? But it really means a lot. Wi-Fi and internet access, right, continue to be a challenge. And there were many people who struggled with access to Wi-Fi, especially virtual schooling. Some kids didn't have access to laptop and even the Chromebooks that the Brookline Public Schools provided, they were not sufficient. BHA recently provided free internet through Starry, but it, it doesn't work. And I think a couple of reasons why. One, the building itself, and another, the speed of the internet. So they provided this internet, it's like, 30 megabits or whatever you call that per second, right? But when the 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 more the faster speed is like $50, $50 a month, and it gives you like 200 megabytes, megabytes, megabits, whatever you call it. Like, can you imagine if you had 200 compared to 30, maybe you could actually get on the, you know, we wouldn't drop from Zoom calls, you wouldn't drop from school, you know. Um, anyway, I feel like one of the ways that the opera money could be used is utilizing it toward providing internet that actually works, right? And I've said this before, internet's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Um, and I can't say it enough, people need to understand that for some paying for internet isn't as easy as you think. Additionally, ARPA funds can help prepare for the next pandemic. And this is just a few ways how. We have to support BIPOC people with access to food and housing. COVID tests needs to be made available to seniors and marginalized groups. Um, and as a social worker, I can't stress enough the need for mental health services. And lastly, this town has to stop ignoring systemic racism. Thanks. Wow, Kimberly, um, I can't thank you enough for just the many different lenses that you brought to seeing how the pandemic continues to unfold. And then also, I just really appreciate the actionable items that that you suggested um sort of foreshadowing one of my questions i was going to ask the group um but also the digital divide yeah it's definitely a necessity especially when you have to sign up for covid tests and everything else only through the internet um even when you go to cvs they say well you just sign up online um until you press them and say i just need a phone number so um Thank you so much, Kimberly. So we'll, we'll get back and have a robust discussion soon. So our next panelist is Dr. Irving Allen. He is a retired psychiatrist who practiced this specialty for 50 years in the greater Boston area. He is an emeritus psychiatrist to the Harvard University Health Service and is employed 
by the Veterans Administration for 15 years, specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder. The Massachusetts Psychiatric Society named Dr. Allen the Outstanding Clinical Psychiatrist of the Year in 2006. His work in writing in support of Boston's Black school children undergoing the stress of desegregation resistance was cited by that award. And his interest in racial disparities has spanned his entire career, both at the clinical patient level as well as at the institutional level. He was a developer with four colleagues of, medical of a medical disparities course for Harvard Medical students. He serves also on the National Advisory Board for the Augustus A. White um, Institute, whose mission is to provide quality healthcare services to everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, marital status, and or sexual orientation. And we are so lucky and thankful for your leadership in volunteerism, as you serve as also a commissioner on our Brookline's Town Commission on the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. So welcome, Dr. Allen. Um, Irving, tell us, you know, how do you see it from this lens also as a psychiatrist working on the commission um, and receiving all this data and trying to figure out like, what can we do to help our most vulnerable in Brookline? Well, thank, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, uh, my starting point is having heard this incredible panel is my question to myself is, what am I doing here? Uh, I've been an individual practitioner primarily for all those years. Public health has been on the back burner for me. Uh, as far as my work goes, maybe not as far as my uh, attention goes. One thing that popped into my mind is uh, Dr. Galea was speaking. It seems like a non sequitur, but I think it's relevant. And that is that the United States in the last few days has just passed an anti lynching uh, uh, statute. And people are actually proud that we've done that. And when you think about it, that's unbelievable that something like that has been on the book for 200 years or at least 150 years uh, and partially defended. And what it tells me as relevant to what we're talking about today is that um, there's an in inexorable process that has to be reversed, and that is the racism, uh, sexism, classism, those isms that are, are there and dominating our culture. And even here in Brookline, as insightful and as well-educated as we feel we are, and we are that, but the other is also. I began my career here basically working at a place called Putnam Children's Center, which was at the corner of, uh, of Townsend Street and Warren Avenue. And it was in Shed Center in the absolutely poorest uh, part of the state where TB and other illnesses that many folks thought were cured were running rampant. And it was there that I began, had to begin to learn to appreciate the connection between individual psychiatric needs, which included all the usual diagnoses, depression and anxiety and all that, but how they interrelated with Tremendous social uh, injustices and impediments and uh, uh, factors that, that were destructive of people's lives. It was very difficult to do such prevailing psychiatric theory then, was that it didn't matter what was going on on the outside. Uh, you cope, you adjust, uh, you, you react constructively to that. And over my first 15 years or so in practice, I began to realize that's just not always the case. It may not be uh, often the case that 
society can put enough impediments up in front of people to break that down. And uh, that's the way my career began. It, it, it interacted too with the career at the VA, where I was dealing particularly with Black Vietnam veterans who faced the impossible situation of carrying arms for a country which did not honor them while streets were rioting here in the state, Black Vietnam that were over in Vietnam facing excruciating mental health challenges. That is, is kind of indicative, I think, of what our lives face anyway, and that includes the problem. A, a dilemma, a paradox of trying to be good citizens with everything uh, pitted against it. One thing Brookline has an advantage of, I think it's very timely, and I think it's been alluded to, is the disparity study that came out in February. And I think that could be very instructive uh, for all of us as we think about uh, the next pandemic and how to uh, approach it in a different kind of way. And I have read through it, and I think it's an incredible uh, document and uh, very timely. Um, let me stop there and uh, yield the floor. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Allen. So, you know, there was a lot in what you said. Um, between mental health and then also citing the recent uh, Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations Disparity Report as well. So, you know, I recommend our um, different uh, attendees check that out. It's on the town website. Also, I apologize um, if folks had a hard time hearing. We weren't able to clear up Dr. Irving Allen's audio. Um, and hopefully we can figure that out um, because what he said was is also very important. Thank you. So I wanted to um, now open it up for you know some discussion. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, raise your hand, however, and our amazing team at the Brookline Department of Health, Pat, Lynn, and Darlene will be able to float those up to us. Um, Oh, okay. I've got a question and I love it. Hi, Leonard Woolley. Um, hi, Len. So um, he asked, and this is a great question, and I'd love any one of our panelists to answer it with their academic lived experience. However, what role does transportation play in public health? Does our current transportation system contribute towards people being sicker than they should be? Good question, Leonard Woolley. Who would like to take this? I mean, I, I'll take a stab. Okay. And, and then would love others to, to jump in if needed. But I mean, I, the ways that I think about transportation, um, both from a public from a public health perspective, is around. Um, uh, access to uh, reliable transportation is critical. Uh, and I think is uh, I see it as a social determinant of health, right? So social determinants of health are um, um, the things, the, the most simplest way that I have sort of thought about it or learned about it is everything that makes you healthy that's not your medical care. So safe and affordable housing, um, food, nutritious food, healthy, nutritious food, access to reliable transportation, um, child care, um, your community climate. And so all of these things that um, we interact with, any individual interacts with in their normal daily life, um, the less access that they that that people that we have to those things the um the less healthy uh, and the worst health outcomes we will have and so it, it by itself transportation i think plays a role but when you think about that in sort of the ecosystem of your daily life um 
it, you know, that, so anyway, so that's how I think about transportation. And so think about going to medical care appointments, seeing family, um, are you able to go to work? Um, and, and all of those things, if you can't do that, say you can't go to work reliably, then you can't earn a living. If you can't earn a living, you don't have enough money for food or housing. And so that's just um, a part of your, your sort of what can make you healthy or what can worsen your your health outcomes. Thank you so much, Giselle. So I, I would put on my professor hat and also give likely the very same answer. Um, it and, and something else to add um, in particular is also just the types of transportation that are around that affects our climate, right? Do you live next to idling buses and then therefore have increased rates of asthma, for example, or um, do you have, um, you know, spaces and places where you can walk to work and get your groceries? You know, how does that affect? How do you, how are your steps, right? Can, can you do that? Um, so there's so much wrapped into that. So Leonard Woolley, who's also of the transportation board in Brookline, good question. Um, we, we have so many and I want to get to to a number of them. Another question from Diana McClure of the League of Women Voters of Brookline. She says, how can the folks who make these decisions about the distribution of ARPA funds be focused on pandemic related issues? There's pressure to use this money to fill all these other gaps. So um, I'm not sure who would be best able to answer this question. Maybe it's Giselle, because I think you have been working with the town, but basically there's, um, you know, correct me, add in more. There's um, a small committee that's looking at all the ARPA proposals. It's 43 million. They send their recommendations to the select board, which is our executive body who will make the determination. But please give us a little bit more because I think that was just too quick for everyone. Giselle. Yeah, no, I think that is the, the process of how funding decisions will be made. Um, I know that, that uh, the proposal review committee or the ARPA Review Committee um, uh, is looking at certainly the, the Community Foundations report and elevating those areas for investment. I think the other thing that, that stands out is they've also Oh, Giselle, you froze for a moment. Oh, no. See, the, di the digital divide is real, folks, just as Kimberly has said. Um, we're gonna in this first round, it's about 22 million. And they've also, I'm, I hope I'm not gonna get the numbers wrong, but I know 12 million, 12 million of those uh, are gonna be dedicated to proposals that support vulnerable populations. I think about 5 million, it's government, government services. Um, there's a handful that's for technology improvements. Um, and then about, Five million for economic recovery. So, I hope I didn't get those numbers wrong. But the the point being is, with those twenty two, they've made specific um, determinations as to how much funding would go to to projects that address those particular things. Thank you so much, Giselle. So one thing I guess I just want to lay out here is, in case it's not clear to those of us in Brookline, because I know it wasn't clear to me, and at times door knocking for candidates, people would say, hey, Marty Walsh is doing a great job. And I would say, the mayor of Boston? No, we live in Brookline. We have a totally different system. We're in a town. So I just want to put it out there that our executive board, our mayor essentially, are five select board members that you vote for in your local town elections that this year will happen on May 3rd. In order to vote in our May 3rd elections, you need to be registered to vote. So you should double check your precinct also because we got redistricted and you might have to be and everyone's voting, right? And that cutoff to, to register is April 13th. So go to your, your town clerk's office and make sure you register to vote because who you vote for determines who's on your select board, your executive board, and those folks will help determine this distribution of say ARPA funding, right? And it also, you will end up voting for your town meeting members, which is our legislative body and they'll vote for your town's budget, which will determine what money goes into schools, housing, transportation, recreation, open space, and everything else. So I just have to put a plug in there. You care and you wanna know how the money's dispersed, the, the number one actionable item I think you can do is to vote, right? And, and make your voice heard that way, you have to do it. Um, so April 13th, make sure you're registered, last day to do that in Brookline, May 3rd, Tuesday is the election here in town. Um, so we have more questions. So um, Charles Homer, you said the cost of housing is the largest burden for low income families and probably you think the most critical area of need among the social determinants of health. 
So what do you think is the role for public health in promoting and enabling more affordable quality housing? We'll turn it over to one of our panelists. Because well, I know let, that housing. Let me, Thank you. Let me, let me, um, let me try to um, offer an academic answer and open it up to the others. I think uh, public health has a role in changing the conversation on health. And uh, I, I often say when I'm speaking that my, um, I feel like our work will be done, that's an exaggeration, when in a presidential uh, primary, you see the candidates debating housing policy because of its impact on health, not just for housing policy for its own sake, but actually saying, well, my housing policy is going to promote health and here's why. Like when that enters the conversation, that housing matters for health. And I think conversations like this that we're having here are really important and particularly important to sort of make sure that this, these topics diffuse out into the broader public. So I do think that, at, you know, in a group, in a room like this, so to speak, a virtual room, you know, we tend to gather here, we, we tend all to understand that, but it is outside of the understanding of most people. We've done surveys to show this. When you ask people what matters for their health, the majority of people don't mention housing. People don't really think of housing as matter for their health. And that's something that we need to change. Thank you so much, Dean Galea. Um, and I, I was going to jump in because I also, um, I, when I was working at a health nonprofit, one of the things that I would see a lot are the investments that health systems were making in housing. And that tells you already if hospitals are making investments in housing for their population, that means that they see the business case right? Not just, of course, the moral case, but the business case for if people have um, housing, that will, that that's a direct correlation to their health. And when you're in the business of health systems too, then um, it costs less money <laughs> to sort of, um, it would cost hospitals um, and providers less money to care for people who have safe and affordable housing. Um, and so they're always, so what I learned um, just learning uh, from hospitals is that when they think about the business case and how much money they're spending per uh, person who walks into their hospital, um, they want to reduce what, what they call sort of the, um, I think it's the high utilizers, right? So who is using our system? Because the, 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 the system in our country is a sick care system, right? And so we are taking care of your sickness or treating your sickness, not preventative. And so social determinants of health, if we can make investments in that, like housing, um, that is um, preventative so that you don't get uh, sick in the first place or less sick. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out around um, hospital systems really thinking about, and I think, I think uh, BMC, Boston Medical Center, as well as um, MGH have made significant uh, million dollar investments in housing in their surrounding um, sites or locations because of this uh, specific question, housing as health. Thank you so much, Giselle. Um, so we're getting close to time and um, I, I just, there's so much, I, I just wish I could take you all for another 60 minutes. Um, but I, I wanna do a little bit of a lightning round here. Um, some folks may or may not know this, but I am, I really love Disney and all things Disney World and going to visit and all that fairy tales and things. Um, and so, if you know you're a fairy godmother <laughs> and you could wave a wand and you could do one thing grant a wish that you would do right now and potentially with the 43 million of ARPA funding um what would you do now with it so that Brookline is best prepared for as Dr. Galea says the next contagion so we'll start off um with Giselle I have to do two. The first is absolutely direct assistance to um, vulnerable populations. And um, like Kimberly said, um, just guaranteed income or whatever you want to call it, people need money and we need to trust people uh, with um, 
what they need to do with that money and the decisions that that they need to make for their families and for themselves with that money. So that's one. And the second is I do think it is important to invest in the public health infrastructure in our community um, because I think um, there are, there are some significant gaps. Thank you so much. Um, Kimberly Richardson, you have the wand. I'm not too also, and this is so hard, but I think one I'm thinking about, I think Giselle, you said housing is health or something like that. When you come home, you're, you're like coming home to not only affordable home, but a home that makes you feel good when you walk through the doors. So I would, for all those who are living in BHA in, in conditions that aren't, you know, great, just poor conditions, I would change every unit in BHA because they deserve that. And I think the second thing, which is um, is mental health services. It's just, it's so needed right now from the oldest to the youngest. Um, and so that my one would do that. Thank you. And Dr. Allen, and if you can almost, you know, be as robust into your microphone as possible. Well, I, I like everything that's been mentioned, but uh, I think I would pick housing. Uh, I've lived in Brookline since 1969, and it's my strong impression that it has become harder and harder to live in Brookline. Uh, the money disappears on housing, and I think we're in danger of putting in effect policies that we think are helpful, uh, but may not be in the process rolled right on with Brookline becoming more and more affluent and difficult to buy homes in or even rent. Thank you. And Dean Sandro Galea. Well, I would like to endorse everything that's been said, because I like all of those ideas. So I'm actually in favor of everything that um, my uh, panelists, fellow panelists, uh, Giselle Kimberly and Dr. Van der Irving have said. But um, just to throw in one more idea into the mix, um, I, I, I see no reason why Brookline can't be a leader in um, programs like uh, baby bond programs that really uh, I see as have tremendous potential in terms of bridging racial divides in wealth and assets over time. Now, these are long-term acting pro programs. Um, I see no reason why Brookline can't be a leader in um, universal basic income programs, which I think is sort of has shades of what Giselle has said. So, uh, I, you know, I think the challenge, I mean, 43 million is not a lot of money. So you asked us to stick it in the 43 million bucket. Um, if you said, you know, magic wand with a billion, that's a different issue. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think ultimately, one would need to balance the the immediate, which I think is, you know, I agree with my fellow panelists, circles around housing as well as infrastructural resources to protect us collectively, but also to talk about the important, the medium term important. And I think that involves um, creating systems to narrow wealth gaps and to make sure that everybody has the potential to live a life with dignity and with enough resources for to be able to function in the world and achieve their potential. Thank you so much. Um, and then I guess I wanna give a shout out cause I, I read so much. You also talk um, really, you know, uh, with such, it just spoke to my heart about um, universal child care and universal pre-K. And, and that's just, I think a game changer that I don't know why we don't do it in Brookline. So I didn't actually talk about schools because I was like, I was debating yes. in my mind because I'm like, you know, we already spend money on schools, but yes, if I would present against it would be at education. You know, usually my answer to that is like, you know, one needs to invest in wealth, in, in systems to make sure everybody has builds up wealth over generations, to make sure that everybody has a livable wage of some sort and to make sure that we have the best possible education. Those are my three. They're all medium term impacts. So one needs to understand that. So, you know, so, so I think there is a, there's, there's a need to invest in the short term because a lot of people are affected in the short term, but that's, but that's for medium to long term impact. So I think next time, instead of a fairy godmother with a wand, I'm going to have to do a genie with the lamp and three wishes because y'all did two to three to five things. So we're going to have to, to switch my, <laughs> my question. Um, so, you know, first I want to just thank you all for being here. Um, our panelists, 
Lynn, Pat, Darlene, and Richard for organizing this in the Brookline Department of Public Health. Um, and then to Dean Galea and uh, Giselle, Kimberly, and Irving for being here and sharing your lived experience, your research experience, your um, just your heart and care in hoping to ensure that Brookline sees public health as a public good and that we do right, you know, as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic. Um, this was the start of a whole week of National Public Health Week events here in Brookline and across the nation. So if you look in your chat, there's a lot, a lot more for this week. I mean, teens and screens, who doesn't want to know more about that? We've, we've got that. Meditation, honoring Paul Farmer. There is so much out there in meditation. So join the rest of the week's events that they have you know, lovingly put together here at the health department. Um, and then also to let you know, we, you know, we come full circle. We, we started with the book. I want to end with the book because um, every word he writes is just, it's like literally the most amazing prose I've ever um, read. So I have to end with it. He says, to change the world, Dean Galea says, we must first acknowledge that it is far bigger than we are that the forces that shape it are more influential than even the best science. It is then our task to work collectively toward the solutions we began to advance while the pandemic was still raging. We have a clear choice in this post-pandemic moment. We can yield to the temptation of hubris, ignoring what matters most for health in favor of an approach that opened the door to COVID-19, or we can have the humility to engage with larger forces, to be aware that we do not know what we do not know, and to advance a vision for health. We can see only when we have taken our eye off of distractions, however shiny and cutting edge they may be. How we choose will determine how healthy we are able to be in the years to come. So I'm asking you to choose with your vote in Brookline, on May 3rd. Your vote is your voice, as the League of Women Voters would say. Democracy is not a spectator sport, right? So make this choice, vote in every and all elections, okay? And then this book, which you can also buy as a pair, um, are available at the Brookline Booksmith, the Brookline Libraries, your independent bookseller, and they'll be great for Easter baskets, Mother's Day presents, graduation gifts, and just more right so read it right make it make it your bible so that we are ready for the contagion the next time thank you all have a very good night stay well <laughs>